Okay, well, this one got out, out of the gate just a little bit ahead of the time I was ready for it. <laughs> we will go on. Good evening, Vallas. You're John the Baptist. That's great. Uh, you've returned to prophesy. Uh, you've returned with the prophecy of the Temple of Solomon. Terrific. Uh, the Rothschild family will be building the Temple of Solomon. Okay, well, if they do that for us, that would be very kind of them. Okay, while we, uh, before we get going here, I'm going to continue on with my reading of the Red Book. Before, but before I do that, um, I want to share with you uh, again, uh, there will be a uh, meeting of many of the most influential Jungian analysts of our time uh, in Ascona, Switzerland, uh, between April 23rd and April 26th of this year. Okay, I'm looking at these chats. Just be careful, gentlemen. Um, so anyway, many leading Jungian analysts will be participating. Uh, many of them have written essays for Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Postmodern Conditions. And so this is the famous uh, Aronos Conference, and I'm going to just scroll through the, the brochure. There are a few seats left for laymen. Uh, you would have to apply to the um, info at aeronosfoundation.org in order to uh, get in. I'm just going to go quickly through these pages so that you can go back and put the video on still and uh, see what is being said. Uh, but I just want everybody to know it's available and uh, I will be there. Uh, many other very famous Jungian analysts will be there um, and we'll be there for five days. And so I hope you can join us in Switzerland. What's going on here? And so uh, among others, uh, Stuart, Stephen Eisenstadt, who's one of the founders of Pacifica Graduate Institute will be there. And um, Thomas Arst, who is one of the editors of the Jung's Red Book for Our Time will be there. Uh, all these people are quite famous. Joseph Cambray is the current CEO at Pacifica, President CEO. Um, and so there are many very famous Jungian analysts that are going to be in the program. Uh, there are only going to be 150 people allowed. So um, I wouldn't dawdle if you're interested in going to this seminar. And also Mary Stein, who's uh, one of the leading Jungian analysts of our time. He's now living in Switzerland, and he provided uh, in his book, Jung's Map of the Soul and Introduction, he pr provided the input for two of the most uh, recent albums by uh, BTS, which is one of the leading K-pop bands of the world. Um, and so, uh, Okay, well, I'm not here to have a debate about uh, religion per se. I'm here to talk about Jungian psychology. So um, I 
appreciate it, gents, if you would cool it on your uh, approbations of the Roman Catholic Church. Um, that does not reflect my point of view. And if, if you can't cool it, I'm, um, I'm going to uh, have to ban somebody or at least hide your comments. So, so far I'm not doing it, but, um, but I will do if I need to. Okay. So tonight, um, so, and I was reading, I was talking about this book, uh, Jung's Red Book for Our Time, Searching for Soul Under Co Postmodern Conditions, uh, edited by Murray Stein and Thomas Arst. Um, and Nicholas says, Skip, what site is that? Uh, it's probably uh, aranosfoundation.org is what I guess. Um, did I? Oh, here we go. All right. One more time, everybody look for the um, look for the website so that you have it. I'm going to put it up one more time. It is uh, aeronosfoundation.org slash redbook. And um, if you want to attend, you would need to write to info at aeronosfoundation.org. And if you need help in registering, uh, I'm willing to, uh, within some reason, uh, contact uh, the organizers if need be, if, there, if you have a delay in registering or something like that. Um, okay, so I hope that helps, Nick. Um, all right, uh, so tonight I'm reading from the Red Book for, uh, I'm sorry, the, the Red Book uh, by C.G. Young. And uh, I'm reading from the reader's edition. <coughs> this is the folio edition <coughs> behind me. The reader's edition has none of the images in it, uh, but those can be found online. Um, and so I'm trying to give you the words, but not the pictures. And you can find some of the pictures online if you want to. Okay, so uh, Nox Secunda, and which means second night, and the date of this is January 17th, 1914. Now keep in mind that all of these active imaginations, and we've now had, uh, we're on page 333 of the reader's edition, uh, all of the previous material has taken place since December 12th of 1913, and we're now up to January 17th, 1914. These are all active imaginations that are occurring in Dr. Jung's psyche. And so here's the imagination. Nox Secunda. On leaving the library, I stood in the anteroom again. This time I look across to the door on the left. I put the small book into my pocket and go to the door. It is also open and leads to a large kitchen with a large chimney over the stove. Two long tables stand in the middle of the room, flanked by benches. Brass pots, copper pans, and other vessels stand on shelves along the walls. A large, fat woman is standing at the stove apparently the cook, wearing a checkered apron. I greet her, somewhat astonished. She too seems embarrassed. I asked her, I ask her, may I sit down for a while? It's cold outside and I must wait for something. Please have a seat. She wipes the table in front of me. Having nothing else to do, I take out my Thomas and begin to read. The cook is curious and looks at me furtively. Every once in a while, she goes past me. Excuse me, are you perhaps a clergyman? No, why do you think so? Oh, I just thought you might be because you are reading a small black book. 
My mother, may God rest her soul, left me such a book. I see, and what book might that be? It is called The Imitation of Christ. It's a very beautiful book. I often pray with it in the evenings. You have guessed well, I too am reading The Imitation of Christ. I don't believe that a man like you would read such a book unless he were a pastor. Why shouldn't I read it? It also does me good to read a proper book. My mother, God bless her, had, had it with her in her deathbed, and she gave it to me before she died. I browse through the book at, absentmindedly while she is speaking. My eyes fall on the following passage in the 19th chapter, quote, the righteous base their intentions more on the mercy of God, which in whatever they undertake, they trust more than their own wisdom. Thus, in the intuitive method that Thomas recommends, it occurs to me. I turn to the cook. Your mother was a clever woman, and she did well to give you this book. Yes, indeed. It, it has often comforted me in difficult hours, and it always provides good counsel. I become immersed in my thoughts again. I believe one can also follow one's own nose. That would also, that would also be the intuitive method. But the beautiful way in which Christ does this must nevertheless be as of special value. I would like to imitate Christ. An inner disquiet seizes me. What is supposed to happen? I hear an old swishing and whirring, and suddenly a roaring sound fills the room like a horde of large birds. With a frenzied flapping of wings, I see many shadow-like human forms. I see many shadow-like human forms rush past, and I hear a manifold babble of voices utter the words, let us pray in the temple. Where are you rushing off to, I call out. A bearded man with tousled hair and dark shining eyes stops and turns toward me. We are wandering to Jerusalem to pray at the most holy sepulcher. Take me with you. You cannot join us. You have a body, but we are dead. Oh, are you? I am Ezekiel and I am an Anabaptist. Who are those wandering with you? These are my fellow believers. Why are you wandering? We cannot stop, but must make a pilgrimage to all the holy places. What drives you to do this? I don't know, but it seems that we still have no peace, although we died in true belief. Why do you have no peace if you died in true belief? Why do you have no peace if you died in true belief? It always seems to me as if we had not come to a proper end with life. Remarkable how so. It seems to me that we forgot something important that should also have been lived. And what was that? Would you happen to know? With these words, he reaches out greedily and uncannily toward me, his eyes shining as if from inner heat. Let go, demon, you did not live your animal. The cook is standing in front of me with a horrified face. She has taken me by the arm and grips me firmly. For God's sake, she calls out, help what's, help, what's wrong with you? Are you in a bad way? I look at her astonished and wonder where I really am. But soon, strange people burst in, among them the librarian, infinitely astonished and dismayed at first, then laughing mal maliciously. Oh, I might have known. Quick, the police. Before I can collect myself, I am pushed through a crowd of people into a van. I am still clutching my copy of Thomas and ask myself, what, what would he say to the news? What would he say to this new situation? I open the booklet and my eyes fall on the 13th chapter where it says, quote, so long as we live here on earth, we cannot escape temptation. There is no man who is so perfect and no saint so sacred that he cannot be tempted on occasion. 
Yes, we can hardly be without temptation, unquote. Wise Thomas, you always come up with the right answer. That crazy Anabaptist certainly had no such knowledge or he might have made a peaceful end. He also could have read it in Cicero. Rerum omnium satiatus vitae facet satiatatum. Satia, satiatas vitae tempus maturum mortis effort. Satiety of all things causes satiety of life. One is satiated with life and the time is ripe for death. This knowledge had evidently brought me into conflict with society. I was flanked by policemen left and right. Well, I said to them, you can let me go now. Yes, we know all about this, one said laughing. <clears throat> now, now just you hold your peace, said the other sternly. So we obviously hit so we are obviously he headed for the madhouse. That is a high price to pay, but one can go this way too, it seems. It's not so strange since thousands of our fellows take that path. We have arrived, a large gate, a hall, a friendly bustling superintendent, and now also two doctors. One of them is a small fat professor. Professor, what's that book you've got there? I, it's Thomas of Kempis, The Imitation of Christ. Professor, so a form of religious madness, perfectly clear, religious paranoia. You see, my dear, nowadays, the imitation of Christ leads to the madhouse. <laughs> I apologize. Okay, I'll read that again. You see, my dear, toward, uh, you see, my dear, nowadays, the imitation of Christ leads to the madhouse. That is hardly to be doubted, Professor. Professor, the man has wit. He is obviously somewhat maniacal maniacally aroused. Do you hear voices? You bet. Today it was a large throng of Anabaptists that swarmed through the kitchen. Professor, now there we have it. Are the voices following you? Oh no, heaven forbid I summoned them. Professor, ah, this is yet another case that clearly indicates the, that hallucinations directly call up voices. This belongs to the case history. Would you immediately make a note of that, doctor? With all due respect, professor, may I say that it is absolutely not abnormal, but much rather the intuitive method. With all due respect, uh, the intuitive method. Professor, excellent. The fellow also urges neologisms. The fellow also uses neologisms. Well, I suppose we have an adequately clear diagnosis. Anyway, I wish you a good recovery and make sure you stay quiet. But professor, I'm not at all sick. I feel perfectly well. Professor, look, my dear, you don't have any insight into your illness yet. The prognosis is naturally pretty bad with at best limited recovery. The superintendent, professor, can the man keep the book? Professor, well, I suppose so, as it seems to be a harmless prayer book. Now my clothes are inventoried, then the bath, and now I'm taken off to the ward. I enter a large sick room where I'm told to get into bed. The person to my left is lying motionless with a transfixed gaze, while the one to the right appears to possess a brain whose girth and weight are shrinking. I enjoy a perfect silence. The problem, of mad the problem of madness is profound. Divine madness, a higher form of the irrationality of the life streaming through us. At any rate, a madness that cannot be integrated into present day society. But how? What if the form of society were integrated into madness? At this point, things grow dark and there is no end in sight. The growing plant sprouts a sapling on its right, 
the growing plant sprouts a sapling on its right hand side. And when this is completely formed, the natural urge to grow will not develop beyond the final bud, but flows back into the stem, into the mother of the sprig, paving an uncertain way in the dark and through the stem and finally finding the right position on the left where it sprouts a new sapling. But this new direction of growth is completely opposed to the previous one. And yet the plant nevertheless grows regularly in this way without overstraining or disturbing its balance. <clears throat> on the right is my thinking, on the left is my feeling. I enter the space of my feeling, which was previously unknown to me, and see with astonishment the difference between my two rooms. I cannot help laughing. Many laugh instead of crying. I have stepped from the right foot onto the left and wince struck by inner pain. The difference between hot and cold is too great. I leave the spirit of this world, which has thought Christ through to the end and step over into that other funny, frightful realm in which I can find Christ again. <clears throat> the imitation of Christ led me to master him. The imitation of Christ led me to the master himself and to his astonishing kingdom. I do not know what I want there. I can only follow the master who governs this other realm in me. In this, other, in this realm, other laws are valid than the guidelines of my wisdom. Here, the mercy of God, which I had never relied on for good practical reasons, is the highest law of action. The mercy of God signifies a particular state of the soul in which I trust myself to all neighbors with trembling and hesitation and with the mightiest outlay of hope that everything will work out well. I can no longer say that, I can no longer say that this is, I can no longer say that this or that goal should be reached or that this or that reason should apply because it is good. Instead, I grope through mist and night. No line emerges, no law appears. Instead, everything is thoroughly and convincingly accidental. As a matter of fact, even terribly accidental. But one thing becomes dreadfully clear, namely that contrary to my earlier way and all its insights and intentions, henceforth all is error. It becomes ever more apparent that nothing leads as my hope sought to persuade me, but that everything misleads. <clears throat> And suddenly at your shivering horror, it becomes clear to you that you have fallen into the boundless, the abyss, the inanity of eternal chaos. It rushes toward you as if, it, as if carried by the roaring winds of a storm and hurtling waves of the sea. Every man has a quiet place in his soul where everything is self-evident and easily explainable a place to which he likes to retire from the confusing possibilities of life, because there everything is simple and clear, with a manifest and limited purpose. About nothing else in the world can a man say with the same conviction as he does of this place. You are nothing but, and indeed he has said it. Even this place is a smooth surface on every day, an everyday wall, nothing more than a snugly sheltered and frequently polished crust over the mystery of chaos. If you break through this most every day of walls, the overwhelming stream of chaos will flood in. Chaos is not single, but an unending multiplicity. It is not formless, otherwise it would be single but it is filled with figures that have a confusing and an overwhelming effect due to their fullness. These figures are the dead, not just your dead, that is, all the images of the shapes you took in in the past 
which your ongoing life has left behind, but also the thronging debt of human history. The, gas, the ghostly procession of the past, which is an ocean compared to the drops of your own life span. I see behind you, behind the mirror of your eyes, the crush of dangerous shadows, the dead who look greedily through the empty sockets of your eyes, who moan and hope to gather up through you all the loose ends of the ages, which sigh in them. Your cluelessness does not prove anything. Put your ear to that wall and you will hear the rustling of their procession. Now you know why you lodge the simplest and most easily explained matters in just that spot why you praise the peaceful seat as the most secure so that no one, least of all yourself, would unearth the mystery there. For this is the place where day and night agonizingly merge. What you excluded from your life, what you renounced and damned, everything that was and could have done, gone wrong awaits you behind that wall before which you sit quietly. <clears throat> Let me read that again. What you excluded from your life, what you renounced and damned, everything that was and could have gone wrong awaits you behind that wall before which you sit quietly. If you read the books of history, you will find men who sought the strange and the incredible, who ensnared themselves and who were held captive by others in wolves' lairs, men who sought the highest and the lowest, and who were wiped by fate, incomplete from the tablets of the living. Few of the living know of them, and these few appreciate nothing about them, but shake their heads at such delusion. Just wait a second. Sorry for the delay here. Just trying to make sure I have things going. Okay, continuing on, on page 341, I'm reading from the Red Book by C.G. Young, the Reader's Edition. While you mock them, one of them stands behind you, panting from rage and despair at the fact that your stupor does not attend to him. He besieges you in sleepless nights. Sometimes he takes hold of you in an illness. Sometimes he crosses your intentions. He makes you overbearing and greedy. He pricks your longing for everything, which avails you nothing. He devours your success in discord. He accompanies you as your evil spirit, to whom you can grant no release. Have you heard of those dark ones who roamed incognito alongside those who ruled the day, conspiratorially, conspiratorially causing unrest, who devised cunning things and who did not shrink from any crime to honor their God. Beside them placed Christ, who was the greatest among them. It was too little for him to break the world, so he broke himself, and therefore he was the greatest of them all and the powers of this world did not reach him. But I speak of the dead who fell prey to power, broken by force and not by themselves. Their hordes, their hordes people the land of the soul. If you accept them, they fill you with their delusion and rebellion against what rules the world. From the deepest and from the highest, they devise the most dangerous things. They were not of a common nature, but fine blades of the hardest steel. They would have nothing to do with the small lives of men. They lived on the heights and accomplished the lowest. They forgot only one thing, they did not live their animal. The animal does not rebel against its own kind. 
consider animals, how just they are, how just they are, how well behaved, how they keep to the time honored, how loyal they are to the land that bears them, how they hold to their accustomed roots, they, uh, how they care for their young, how they go together to pasture, and how they draw one another to the spring. There is not one that conceals its overabundance of prey and lets its brother starve as a result. There is no one that tries to enforce its will on those of its own kind. Not a one mistakenly imagines that it is an elephant when it is, when it is a mosquito. I'll read that again. Not a one, not a one mistakenly imagines that it is an elephant when it is a mosquito. The animal lives fittingly and true to life of its species, neither exceeding nor falling short of it. He who never lives his animal must trust his brothers like an animal. Abase yourself and live your animal so that you will be able to treat your brother correctly. You will thus redeem all those roaming dead who strive to feed on the living. And do not turn anything you do into a law, since that is the hubris of power. When the time has come and you open the door to the dead, your horrors will also afflict your brother, for your countenance proclaims the disaster. Hence withdraw and enter solitude, since no one can give you counsel if you wrestle with the dead. Not, do not cry for help if the dead surround you. Otherwise, the living will take flight, and they are your only bridge to the day. Live the life of the day, and do not speak of mysteries, but, de but dedicate the night to bringing about the salvation of the dead. For whoever well-meaningly tears you away from the dead has rendered you the worst service, since he has torn your life branch from the tree of divinity. He also sins against restoring what was created and later subjugated and lost. For the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the, waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God. For the creature was made subject to vanity, not willingly, but by reason of him who hath subjected the same in hope, because the creature itself also shall be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation groaneth and travaileth in pain together until now. Every step upward will restore the, a step downward so that the dead will be delivered into freedom. The creating of the new shrinks from the day since its essence is secret. Read that again. The creating of the new shrinks from the day since its essence is secret. It prepares the destruction of precisely this day in the hope of leading to over in the hope of leading over into a new creation. Something evil is something evil is attached to the creation of the new, which you cannot proclaim loudly. The animal that looks for new hunting grounds cowers slinking and sniffing on dark paths and does not want to be surprised. Please consider that it is the suffering of the creative that they carry something evil in them, a leprosy of the soul that separates them from its danger. They could praise their leprosy as a virtue and could indeed do so out of virtuousness. But this would be doing what Christ does and would therefore be his imitation. For only one has, for only one was Christ and only one could violate the laws as he did. It is impossible to commit higher infringement on this path. Fulfill that which comes to you. Break the Christ in yourself so that you may arrive at yourself and ultimately 
at your animal which is well behaved in its herd and unwilling to infringe its laws. May it suffice in terms of transgression that you do not imitate Christ, since thereby you take a step back from Christianity and a step beyond it and a step beyond it. Christ brought salvation through adeptness, and ineptitude will save you. Have you have you counted the death whom the master of sacrifice honored? Have you asked them for whose sake they believe they have suffered death? Have you entered the beauty of their thoughts and the purity of their intentions? And they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me, for their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched. <clears throat> Thus do penance consider what fell victim to death consider what fell victim to death for the sake of Christianity. Let it before you and force yourself to accept it. Lay it before you and force yourself to accept it. For the dead need salvation. The number of the unredeemed dead has become greater than the number of living Christians. Therefore, it is time that we accept the dead. Do not throw yourself against what has become enraged or bent on destruction. What will you put in its place? Do you not know that if you are successful in destroying what has become you, what has become, you will then turn the will of destruction against yourself. But anyone who makes destruction their goal will perish through self-destruction. Much much rather, much rather respect what has become, since reverence is a blessing. Then turn to the dead, listen to their lament, and accept them with love. Be not their blind spokesman. There, there are prophets who in the end have stoned themselves. But we seek salvation, and hence we need to revere what has become and to accept the dead who have fluttered through the air and lived like bats under our roofs since time immemorial. The new will be built on the old and the meaning of what has become will become manifold. Your poverty in what has become, you will thus deliver into the wealth of the future. <clears throat> Gentlemen, I still have, uh, oh my heavens, at least a couple more pages to read. Two more pages, and then I'll come back. What seeks to distance you from Christianity and its holy rule of love are the dead who could find no peace in the Lord since their uncompleted work was fa followed, has followed them since their uncompleted work has followed them. A new salvation is always, always a restoring of the previous lost. Did not Christ himself restore bloody sacrifice? Did not Christ himself restore bloody human sacrifice, which better customs had expelled from sacred practice since days of old? Did he not himself reinstate the sacred practice of eating of human sacrifice? If your sacred practice, that which earlier laws condemned, will once again, in your sacred practice, that which earlier laws condemned will once again be included. However, just as Christ brought back human sacrifice and the eating of the sacrifice, all this happened to him and not to his brother, since Christ placed above it the highest law of love so that no brother would come to harm as a result, but so that all could rejoice in the restoration. The same thing happened as in ancient times, but now under the law of love. So if you have no reverence for what has become, you will destroy the law of love. And what will become of you then? 
you will be forced to restore what was before, namely violent deeds, murder, wrongdoing, and contempt for your brother, and one will be alien to the other, and confusion will rule. Therefore, you should have reverence for what has become, so that the law of love may become redemption through the restoration of the lower and of the past, not perdition through the boundless mastery of the dead, but the spirits of those who die before their time will live for the sake of their present incompleteness in dark hordes in the rafters of our houses and besiege our ears with urgent laments until we grant them redemption through restoring what has existed since ancient times under the rule of love. What we call temptation is the demand of the dead who passed away prematurely and incomplete through the guilt of the good and of the law. For no good is so complete that it could not do injustice and break what should not be broken. We are a blinded race. We live only on the surface, only in the present, and think only of tomorrow. We deal roughly with the past in that we do not accept the dead. We want to work only with visible success. Above all, we want to be paid. We would consider it insane to do hidden work that does not visibly serve men. There is no doubt that the necessity of life forced us to prefer only those fruits one can taste. But who suffers more from the tempting and misleading influence of the dead than those who have gone wholly missing on the surface of the world? There is one, ne there is one necessary but hidden and strange work, a major work, which you must do in secret for the sake of the dead. He who cannot attain his own visible field and vineyard is held fast by the dead who demand the work of atonement from him. And until he has fulfilled this, he cannot get to his outer work since the dead do not let him. He shall have to search his soul and act in stillness at their behest and complete the mystery so that the dead will so that the dead will not let him. Do not forget, I'm sorry, do not look forward so much, but back into yourself so that you will not fail to hear the dead. If it belongs to the way of Christ that we ascend with few of the living, but many of the dead, his work was the salvation of the despised and lost for the, whose sake he was crucified between two criminals. I suffer my agony between two madmen. I enter the truth. I enter the truth if I descend, become accustomed to being alone with the dead. It is difficult, but this is precisely how you will discover the worth of your living companions. What the ancients did for their dead what the angels, I'm sorry, <clears throat> what the ancients did for their dead. You seem to believe that you can absolve yourself from the care of the dead and from the work that they so greatly demand since what is dead is past. You excuse yourself with their, your disbelief in the immortality of the soul. Do you think that the dead do not exist because you have devised the impossibility of immortality. You believe in your idols of words. The dead produce effects that is sufficient. In the inner world, there is no explaining away, as little as you can explain away the sea in the outer world. You must finally understand your purpose in explaining away, namely to seek protection. I accepted the chaos, and in the following night, my soul approached me. Okay, so that's the end of Nox Secunda. There are quite some quite long uh, footnotes here, but I'm just going to look at your um, comments. Um, okay, I'm going to 
the show, Nicholas, Nicholas had one thing moderated here. Um, okay, so Grace says, broken by force and not by themselves. Uh, Jung might be the greatest biologist ever. Uh, beavers build dams because they, uh, because what, be beavers build dams because that's what beavers do. Nicholas Chan Gray, interesting, do elaborate. Gray says, we are always focused on what our goals are rather than what the psyche wants. The beaver doesn't have that problem. The acorn is the same as the oak. We don't live ourselves when we don't live our animal. Nicholas, but I mean elaborate about Jung, the biologist. We don't hear that often, Gray. I would consider all of the Red Book to be a biological understanding of the unconscious and why and how we need to make it conscious. He is the biological digger of the unconscious, which is a Darwinian system. Nicholas Gray, that is nothing short of a brilliant assessment to me. Awesome. It will receive a lot of flack in many a YouTube conference, so I would keep it to myself. Nicholas Chan, what? But that is just me. Gray says, the psychological types are biological tools to deal with the unconscious. Nicholas, thank you for stating it so plainly, though. Amazing, really. I totally understand, but never occurred to nail it so neatly. Of course, friend. And Pedro says, I was listening to the Red Book reading while playing Fallout, New Vegas, and it started speaking to me. Everything was coincidental, but I believe God gave Carl Jung visions of a video game, or I'm not clear, emot emoticon. Uh, the book was speaking of my, to my spirit while my character was traveling through Zion Canyon. <laughs> What do you think? I think that's quite possible. And Gray, I, I think that's a very um, interesting and uh, apt analysis. It's actually wonderful. And, uh, you know, the thing about unique analyses is um, you have to put your head up over the parapet to express it. But if it's right, then everybody's going to have to follow you. Um, and uh, it sounds right to me. I mean, it's, it's incredibly right to me. So uh, I'm very impressed. And Nicholas, I'll just mention to you that Gray is a biology teacher. So he does know something about this. Um, well, let me see if I, I have these um, footnotes in me because they're quite long. And they're quite small print. And unfortunately, my 73-year-old eyes are not quite up to what they were at one time. I'll give it a go. What time is it? 7 o'clock. Um, Okay, the text reads, the righteous base their intentions more on the mercy of God, which in whatever they undertake, they trust more than their own wisdom. And the footnote reads, the resolve of the upright depends upon the grace of God, not on their own wisdom. In him they trust whatever they undertake. For man proposes, God disposes, and it is not for man to choose his lot. And that's from The Imitation of Christ, Book 1, Chapter 19, page 54. Um, and then, let's see where this next footnote is. Can't find the text passage, but, <clears throat> oh, here it is. 171. Okay. Text reads, this is the intuitive method that Thomas recommends. It occurs to me. 
I turn to the cook and the footnote reads, in, uh, instead of this sentence, Black Book 4 has, well, Henri Bergson, I think there you have, there you have it. This is precisely the genuine and right intuitive method. On March 20, 1914, Adolf Keller gave a talk on Bergson and the theory of libido to the Zurich Psychoanalytic Society. In the discussion, Jung said Bergson should have been discussed here long ago. B says everything that we have not said. On July 24th, 1914, Jung gave a talk in London where he noted that his constructive method corresponded to Bergson's intuitive method. On psychological understanding, collected papers on analytical psychology Constance Long. The work Jung read was L'Evolution Creatrice. He possessed the 1912 German translation. Okay. Um, okay, the text reads, I become immersed in my thoughts again. I believe one man I believe one can also follow one's own nose. That would also be, and the footnote reads, Carrie Baines's transcription has Bergson's. Okay. Now there's a, uh, text here is, I am Ezekiel and I am an Anabaptist. And the footnote reads, the biblical Ezekiel was a prophet in the sixth century BCE. Jung saw a great deal of historical significance in his visions, which incorporated a mandala with four quaternities as representing the humanization and differentiation of Yahweh. Although Ezekiel's visions are often viewed as pathological, Jung defended their normality, arguing that visions are natural phenomena that can be des designated as pathological only when their morbid aspects have been demonstrated. Answer to Job, Collected Works 11, Paragraph 665, 667, and 686. Anabaptism was a radical movement of the 16th century, Protestant Reformation, which tried to restore the spirit of the early church. The movement originated in Zurich in the 1520s, where they rebelled against Zwingli and Luther's reluctance to completely reform the church. They rejected the practice of infant baptism and promoted adult baptisms. The first of these took place in Zollikon, which is near Kusnach, where Jung lived. Anabaptists stressed the immediacy of the human relation with God and were critical of religious institutions. The movement was violently suppressed and thousands were killed. <clears throat> you think? All right. Okay. Then the text reads, let go demon, you did not live your animal. And the footnote reads, in 1918, Jung argued that Christianity had suppressed the animal element in his book, On the Unconscious, uh, I'm sorry, in his essay on the unconscious, uh, collected works 10, paragraph 31. He elaborated this theme in his 1923 seminars in Palsy, Cornwall. In 1939, he argued that the psychological sin which Christ committed was that he did not live the animal side of himself. Okay. 
the text reads, yes, we can hardly be without temptation. And the footnote reads, chapter 13 of the book, chapter 13 of book one of the imitation of Christ begins, as long as we are in this world, we shall have to face trials and temptations. As it says in the book of Job, what is man's life on earth but a time of temptation? That is why we should treat our temptations as a serious matter and endeavor by vigilance and prayer to keep the devil from finding any loophole. Remember that the devil never sleeps, but goes about looking for his prey. There is no one so perfect and holy that he never meets temptations. We cannot escape it altogether. He goes on to emphasize the benefits of temptation as being the means through which a man is humbled, purified, and disciplined. The text reads, he also could have read it in Cicero, uh, satiety of all things causes satiety of life. One is satiated with life and the time is ripe for death. And the footnote reads, the citation is from Cicero's Cato Maior de Senectut, Cato the Elder on Old Age. The text is a eulogy to old age. The lines Jung cites are italicized in the following passage. Long passage here in Latin, but I think there's a translation here. Undoubtedly, as it seems to me at least, satiety of all things causes satiety of life. Boyhood has certain pursuits. Does adolescence yearn for them? Adolescence has its pursuits. Does the matured or so-called middle stage of life need them? Maturity too has such as not even sought in old age. And finally, there are those suitable to old age. Therefore, as the pleasures and pursuits of the earlier periods of life fall away, so also do those of old age. And when that happens, one is satiated of life and the time is right for death. Okay. <laughs> I was just trying to think if I'm uh, satiated with life yet. Okay, another uh, text. At this point, things grow dark and there is no end in sight. And the footnote reads, in the draft, a passage occurs here, a paragraph of which follows. Since I was a thinker, my feeling was the lowest, oldest, and least developed. When I was brought up against the unthinkable through my thinking, and that was unreachable through my thoughts, and that was unreachable through my thought power, then I could only press forward in a forced way, but I lo overloaded on one side and the other side sank deeper. Overloading is not growth, which is what we need. Um, okay, the text reads, and do not turn anything you do into a law since that is the hubris of power. And the footnote reads, in 1930, Jung said in a seminar, we are prejudiced in regard to the animal. People don't understand when I tell them they should become acquainted with their animal or assimilate their animals. They think the animal is always jumping over walls and raising hell all over town. But in nature, the animal is well behaved, is a well behaved citizen. It is pious. It follows the path with great regularity. It does nothing extravagant. Only man is extravagant. So if you assimilate the character of the animal, you become a peculiarly law abiding citizen. You go very slowly and you become very reasonable in your ways. 
in as much as you can afford it. <clears throat> I'm cherry picking a little here. There's a biblical reference, which is um, Romans 8, 19. And then there's another citation, Isaiah 66, 24. Thank you, Gray. That's very kind of you. I appreciate it. The, uh, Gray says the four quaternities in Ezekiel's vision also represent the four go gospels. Skip, can you talk about the value of four over three? Um, Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're asking me a question that it's in my um, weak spot here, um, but let me see if I can do it. Basically, three is, un, un, is an unstable number, at least according to Dr. Young. And so, uh, for example, um, we transform through life, and uh, the simplest was it would be uh, one is a man, two is a woman. They together make a third thing, which is a child. Now that when that happens, now you have something else, and it becomes something else and that something else is a family. And then that family is not only a fourth thing, but it is a one again. And uh, I just mentioned that I had a granddaughter born about a month ago or a couple weeks back anyway. And um, she was brought <laughs> <laughs> to our twin grandchildren who are now uh, nearly three and uh, the twins are a boy and a girl and there's this just wicked little smile on the face of the little twin girl uh, looking at the baby and you go oh my god you know what's going on in that mind and so <laughs> so now there are three children and that's unstable. And so mother has to intercede to protect the one from the other. So that mother is the fourth thing in that case. Um, it, we're also talking here about the uh, axiom of Maria. Uh, the axiom of Maria dates from the third century from Maria Prophetessa. And uh, her axiom one one because her axiom was one becomes two, two becomes three, three becomes four, which becomes one again. And so things are always evolving. And so a fourth thing emerges and that fourth thing is always a first, a first thing again. So one is the father, two is mother, three is a baby and those three together that are a family that's the fourth thing uh, which is also a one again and so the the family uh, in the case of uh, my twin grandchildren what uh, was mother father and baby boy and girl and now there's a, and that was a family and now suddenly <laughs> There's another thing. So those things are always uh, developing. Um, and Nicholas says, archetypes were his animals. Let me go back. Uh, Nicholas says, Jung's original dream was to become an archaeologist. Nandi became an archaeologist indeed of the unconscious. Archetypes were his animals when Skip... Uh, Whoa, Skip, he is. Now that makes it even cooler of, of the unconscious. Yeah. Uh, okay, I hope that 
answered well enough, Graham. I, I have a problem. I personally have a problem with the issue of foreign numerology. And the reason for that is that from a young age, I was living in Asia. And in Asia, the number four, it corresponds with death. Okay. And so it, you could think of it as uh, further development as change, let's say, as in the tarot card, the death card doesn't mean physical death, it means change. And so in both Chinese and ja Japanese, when you're counting, um, in Chinese, it's er san si, si is death. And in Japanese, it's ichi na, ni san shi, she is death also. And so, you know, I learned that up through, you know, most of my life until I was over 40 and I started to look at numerology and Dr. Young's work in more detail. And so that's why I have some difficulty uh, with the idea of four. Um, but what I would say is that if you're interested in these issues, I would go study some numerology. Um, Grace says, all the paintings of this section are mandalas and patterns of four. Yes, correct. And I, I just can't hike around everything that's in the folio volume, but I urge you, I urge everyone to take a look at the folio volume and get your own copy eventually, uh, if you can afford it. It costs about $150, but it's well worth it. Um, search results featured snippet from the web Romans 819 King James Version quote for the earnest expectation of the creature waiteth for the manifestation of the sons of God hmm. unquote and they will go out and look on the dead bodies of those who rebelled against me the worms that eat them will not die the fire that burns them will not be quenched and they will be loathsome to all mankind, Isaiah 66, 24. Thank you for those uh, quotes. I appreciate that. Nicholas says, uh, Ray Gray being a biologist, that makes it cooler, uh, a cooler bit. <laughs> and uh, yes, four is unlucky. Um, well, Dr. Young felt that, you know, always talks about quaternity and uh, at being a stabilization. And of course, if we think of the cross, for example, uh, the cross points to heaven, points to hell, points to the thief, and points to the, uh, the reformed thief, the thief that um, asks forgiveness and, and gets the grace of God. So one thief goes to hell and one goes to heaven and one is un, unrecal, not recal, is a recalcitrant, I think it's recalcitrant uh, thief. And so, you know, one is good and one is evil, the two sides. And so Dr. Jung formulates everything that he talks about and he know, knew a lot about alchemy and how these ideas of numerology came along uh, throughout the middle ages um, all the way back to the time of Pythagoras presumably um, because uh, you know you get the the numbers like three becomes f four and you add those two together and they become seven and uh, there's there's a whole lot of material there and um, so I would urge you to learn something about numerology if you're interested in that uh, and Grace says the cross is an x and it's the spot you are always in yes okay I agree with that. You're always caught between heaven and hell, good and evil. And you're right in the middle of that X. That's a very good way of putting it. Um, 
and uh, I appreciate your uh, your religious knowledge on that because I'm not quite so knowledgeable, especially on um, Catholic Christian doctrine. And Nicholas says, four is certainly stable. What about five though? It's significant in the West for sure. And, uh, you know, I always considered five my lucky number because I was born on the fifth, but, um, but five, when you make a five pointed star and I probably have made a million of them in my life because I've always drawn them in, in my notebooks. And so, I mean, even on this page where, which I'm reading from, you can see five pointed stars that I'm always drawing. But the problem with the five pointed star, if it's upright, is that it is always bouncing to the next thing. And that's kind of the story of my life, which is that I was raised as a son of a naval officer. So my life was never very stable. And we kept bouncing to the next duty station. And obviously, if you reverse it, then it becomes a sign of the devil. So uh, those are some considerations on the number five. Um, uh, so I, you know, I don't know, Nicholas, about whether the X might be the five. I mean, to the extent that it represents a star, um, Yeah, it can represent us as individuals, as the stars represented departed souls historically. And if you uh, looked at my dream from a couple weeks ago, which I uh, put on here, you'll know that I passed into the cosmos into uh, on a train that was headed to the stars and people were getting off at their own stars. and in my active imagination. Uh, and I guess that active imagination, that part of it is actually um, on my political psychology channel, which you can find linked in that particular uh, dream that I had about the, the bus and the little girl almost falling out of the bus. Um, and uh, so I need to stop because my wife is ill and I have to make dinner tonight and uh, be a good husband. So uh, I will excuse myself. Obviously, my voice is shot because this was a 17-page uh, reading. Um, but I'll try to go on with Knox Tertia, Tertia tomorrow, the, the third night. Um, this is all very powerful stuff. Um, yeah, let me see, did I get through all this? I guess I did. Hmm. Well, I'm not sure I got through everything in this night. Oh, yes, I did. Um, anyway, whatever is next, I will be reading it. Um, oh, yeah, okay. I remember that. So these, these get to be uh, very hot and heavy. Um, And uh, they're, they're very profound, these next 120 pages of the Red Book. So I urge you to listen to them as I read them. Um, so I, I'll have to check, Gray. I thought I had finished, but maybe I didn't. Uh, and if I didn't, I'll go back and uh, recap uh, tomorrow. But I do have to end this for now. Um, <laughs> really cool that I'm doing it into Lent. <laughs> I, I hope I'm not doing anything that's uh, 
uh, you know, sacrilegious or anything. But anyway, um, I think that I think they're all good. All all religions are good. So I'm not uh, I'm not trying to be sacrilegious if I am. So I might not have finished, and I will listen to the end of what I read um, to, in the morning and and see what I might have missed. So anyway. Uh, it was a 17 page long uh, passage and I tend to get a little hypnotized when I'm reading these things aloud. So anyway, peace. See you tomorrow. <laughs>